Hi and welcome back. Today we're going to be going through how much a doctor earns and what's even better is I'm going to be showing you my own pay slips. I'm going to be showing you pay slips from the point I started as a new doctor known as a FY1, also known as a foundation year one, all the way through to when I started specialty training known as an ST3 or a CT3 core specialty training. So that's five years worth of pay slips that I'm going to be showing you. Until now, I've been working in the NHS for about 10 years and I've been in my current specialty known as emergency medicine for the last seven years. And I've been a registrar in this role for the last four years. The reason behind showing you my pay slips and how much a doctor earns is so that you get to see the truth and the reality about the big bucks that you think that we earn and what you see and hear and read about what we earn. Some of you are thinking that we're living in these massive mansions, we're driving these Bentleys and Rolls Royces, and that we're the high-flying earners in society. So in this series, each episode is going to be going through the different years of the training, and I'm going to be showing you my own pay slips. Also, if you're an undergraduate or already you're working as a doctor, it's important for you to know exactly what you're going to be earning through the different years of your training, because the earning could have an impact on your choices that you might need to make on your lifestyle. Another reason for making this series is that if you're an undergraduate, you'll get to see exactly how much a doctor earns and you can see that this fits into your lifestyle, your future career plans and goals and the cost versus benefit and whether it's something that potentially a career that you might go into. And also if you're a postgraduate, meaning if you've done another degree and you're going and looking and thinking of studying medicine, then it's very important for you to know exactly how much you're going to be earning because you may already have a family, you may already have other costs like a mortgage, children, other expenditures within your life and therefore it's important to know exactly what you're going to be earning and whether that balances out and whether it fits your lifestyle needs. There's no point ever going into a job in which you're going to be paid less compared to what you thought of before going into it because that could lead you into a lot of financial trouble. And my job is to make sure that doesn't happen so I'm here to show you the truth and be completely transparent, so I'm, hence why I'm showing you my own pay slips. So just a quick background about how one gets to this point of earning and working as a doctor, starting as an FY1, known as a foundation year one. Prior to that, just like everyone else, you would have gone to school, got your A-levels, and then attended university. For us, that's going to medical school. We spend about five, six years at university getting our medical undergraduate training completed, and then the first Wednesday of every August is when the new rotation start for the new junior doctors known as FY1 or Foundation Year 1. In these two years there are generic rotations lasting about four months. So there's three rotations a year where you rotate through specialisms like internal medicine, general surgery, general practice, emergency medicine also known as A&E here in the UK. And this is where you ground your skills as a doctor, develop further knowledge, clinical practice and experience in managing patients and working as part of a larger team. Then after this period of time, we apply for what is known as the core specialty training or ST1 or CT1. This program lasts between two to three years, depending on the type of specialism the doctor is choosing to progress into. Those two, three years are further spent developing different skills needed within that specialism specific to that speciality. In those two, three years, the doctors are making more independent decisions, working as a slightly more senior member within the team. And during this period, they're also gaining the practical skills. For example, if they're a surgical trainee, they'll be doing surgical procedures alongside higher specialist registrars, as well as the consultants. So they're developing those skills needed to go into those roles. Also, during these two, three years, we're also learning and expanding our knowledge and completing the examinations for the different rural colleges. There are different rural colleges for the different specialisms that exist. And each one of those rural colleges has their own unique rural college examination, which is standard across the board which has different sittings throughout the year. Doctors in these specialty trainings must pass those initial examinations in order to get membership and therefore in order to progress to the next level known as the higher specialty training in where you become a registrar. Then you come into the registrar training which can last anywhere between three to six years and it all depends on the specialism um, which dictates the length of training that you have because there's other things such as fellowships that one may need to do to get further specific skills within that specialism. During those three to six years, those registrars are honing in those skills required to become a consultant. They are one of the most senior members in that team 
So they are responsible for the junior doctors that come to them for advice and overviewing their patients as well. And especially at nights and weekends, when the consultants go home, the registrars are the most senior member of the team and therefore they are responsible for their specialism and the patients that are looked after by that speciality. So they are the senior decision makers or what we call the key decision makers within the team. And then finally we come to it all the way at the end of those three to six years of higher specialty training. If one passes the exams known as the, the fellowship or the exit exams then one can then apply to become a consultant. The consultant is the senior most member of the uh, medical or surgical team and they have the overall duty and responsibility for all members of their team as well as all the patients under their care. The quickest route to get to the end of that training is if one is in general practice known as a GP. That takes five years after graduating from medical school. Whereas if you stay in the hospital in either one of the medical or surgical or acute care specialities that potentially could take anywhere up to 10 to 15 years, depending on the specialty, the training, exams, and other fellowships that one may need to do. So that's a very long time for a doctor to go from an FY1 all the way through to being a consultant. And you gotta think of the time spent at university as well, because that's also five to six years. So we're talking on average, roughly between 15 to 20 years. So that's a very long time and the bulk and the majority of that time is spent as a registrar and hence why it's important for you to know about the pay because that's the majority of time spent in your training. For now I'm going to be showing you my own pay slips from the foundation year one up to starting the registrar training and then I'm going to have a separate series that's going to cover doctor's pay grades in accordance with the latest doctor's contract. So we'll have a look at that completely separately and we'll have a complete separate look at the consultant contract. So that's enough of me, let's get into it. So here's my. So here we've got the pay slip and it shows my name at the top and it mentions my rotation is FY1, foundation year one in diabetes. Immediately you can see my salary of 22,412 pounds for the year. Next you can see of the basic pay, 173.81 hours worked at a rate of 10 pound 74. For that, for that many number of hours, it amounts to 1,867 pounds and 67 pence. In the next column, you can see all the deductions that are made for PAYE, national insurance, pension, as well as student loan. And that total amount of deductions amounts to be 512 pounds and 99 pence. So that's then deducted from the 1,867 pounds and 67 pence, which leaves me with a take home in that time period of 1,354 pounds and 68 pence per month. The next payslip I've shown below is of a banded payslip, banded meaning working out of hours, working nights and weekends. So the very first payslip was just working for the standard 40 hours a week, not doing nights and not doing weekends. This next payslip shows you when I was working ENT, ear, nose and throat, and I was working nights and weekends. So again, it shows you the same amount of hours, 173.81 hours, for the same rate of pay at £10.74, which amounts to be the same of 1,867 pounds and 67 pence. But you can see the banding noted as 1B. So for the same number of hours, a rate is attached for the out of hours work, which is antisocial hours of nights and weekends of four pounds and 29 pence. That then equates to 747 pounds and seven pence in addition. Again, we have the deductions that are made for the PAYE, National Insurance and Pension. The total of those deductions amount to 702 pounds and 16 pence. So when deducted away from the income, which is of a banded income for the antisocial hours, the take home pay is 1,912 pounds and 58 pence. So you can quite easily here see the difference, which is why I've put them together of comparing a banded job versus an unbanded job. So remember a banded job is working unsocial hours of nights and weekends and an unbanded means just doing a normal equivalent of nine to five shift of four, 40 hours a week. This is in the banded job from the 1,354 pounds to the 1,912 pounds. So for FY1 you can see the equivalent paid jobs for other people in other professions would be examples such as forklift 
truck drivers, musicians, lab technicians, hairdressing beauty salon managers, bus or coach drivers, curators, painters, decorators, plaster, ambulance staff, farmers, artists, opticians, housing officers, restaurant managers, estate agents, bricklayers, carpenters, librarians, mechanics. These are just a few that I could list. Well, if you like this video, give a thumbs up, leave a like, leave a comment, and please subscribe. It's useful because it gives me good feedback on how I'm doing, where I can improve, and how I can then progress so that I can keep making good, useful, and knowledgeable content. I hope you like it. Thank you very much. See you next time.